Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us. We're just letting everyone make their way from the waiting room to our meeting and we'll start in just a second. All right. And again, welcome. My name is Ken Schopman. I'm the executive director for ABRF. Welcome to this month's town hall. We're going to talk about ABRF's role in science policy and advocacy. We've got a great lineup of speakers who are going to talk about different experiences they've had uh, representing ABRF within FACED and also in other science policy and advocacy activities. Before we get started, just go over a couple of housekeeping announcements. Um, Feel free to use the chat. Everyone is probably going to be muted throughout our program just to deal with background noise. But if you have questions, post them in the chat. Also, if you'd like to introduce yourself, where you're connecting from, um, let's see if we can get all the time zones uh, in North America represented. Sometimes we're able to do that. But again, use the chat for questions. Just a few up up announcements and updates from ABRF. Uh, we have our brand new compensation survey report uh, spearheaded by the Career Development Committee. Uh, you can benchmark your compensation, uh, both financial and non-financial benefits and other activities uh, through this report. You'll see also some information about uh, hiring trends and challenges. This was collected in 2021 and 2022. So we were able to ask questions about the environment during the pandemic and the outlook uh, at the close of the pandemic as well. This is, a fr this is resources entirely free for ABRF members, also available for non-members. And we've included the QR code as well as the hyperlink where you can access that report. Now, as we turn the corner into the summer, it's our season for chapter meetings, starting next week with a Caesar meeting uh, in Atlanta. And then you see the rest of the map here for the upcoming chapter meetings in August, and then the full set of meetings in October for the other three chapters. I hope you've had a chance to log into the ABRF core community. If you haven't, here's a snapshot of how what that looks like. You use the same credentials you use for the ABRF website, and there's a way to sync them, so you only have to log in once. It's a great way to stay in touch with ABRF members, all 2,500 of you at one time, or to find colleagues in your region, in your chapter, as well as colleagues in your area of interest, in genomics, core administration, imaging, and other topics. Uh, we've had great experiences with members posting questions and asking for help, uh, resources, recommendations. It's really a very uh, dynamic way to get to leverage the power of the ABRF community. So please take a moment to explore that. If you have any technical issues or questions in accessing the community, please reach out, contact us. We're happy to help. Very quick, one question survey. You can access it through the hyperlink or the QR code if you're on your phone. We'd like to know what other societies that you're also a part of. Now, we know ABRF's your favorite society, but you may also belong to other societies too. That's okay. Uh, but we wanna identify these because we have a task force that's working on collaboration initiatives and knowing more about the range of societies and the concentration of the overlap between ABRF and those societies will help inform their work about outreach and, and exploring possibilities to work together for joint programming and other activities. Here's our lineup for today, of such an illustrious range of, of speakers. Uh, and this is, I believe, the order in which we're going to have most of them present. Some will just be available to answer questions. So if you have any questions during the program, once again, please use that in the chat. And with that, I'm going to stop our screen, my screen share and turn it over to our president, Marie Adams. Marie? Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, Ken has already done most of my job for me, so thank you so much, Ken. Um, but I'd like to welcome everybody to our discussion today on core facilities and science policy, um, including our partnership with FASAB, um, which is the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology, and I've probably got that wrong, sorry, Naomi. Uh, ABRF has been a member of FASAB for uh, over 25 years, and um, we've had a really active membership. Uh, leadership roles, including the executive board, uh, the DEI council, science advocacy groups, as well as bringing FASAB to ABRF every year um, as part of our meeting to speak directly to our membership on policy topics. 
Uh, today, we're going to showcase several ABRF members that are active on FASAB, as well as give opportunities to ask questions of both them and our FASAB counterpart. Um, but I'd like to open our session uh, with, Naomi, with Naomi Charlambakis, who is the Associate Director of Science Policy, to give us an introduction on FASAB, as well as our Science Policy Partnership. Perfect. Well, thank you all so much for inviting me to chat with you all today. I'm going to share a few slides that I have. Um, let me make sure. I don't believe. Let me stop that and try again. <laughs> okay, let's try that again. Okay. Let's try this and then let me swap. Does everyone see my screen? that look good? Okay, great. Um, so thank you again for, for having me today to chat with you about ABRF's role in science policy and advocacy, what FACET is for those of you that may not be familiar. So that's that's my job today. And hopefully you you leave with some sense of, of who FACET is and how we work. Um, so I'll start with just a little bit about FACET and just give you a bird's eye view of, of how, we, how we operate our governance structure, all of the different committees and task forces and strategic initiatives that, that we do every day as, as we go about our day jobs. Um, I'll also give you a sense of what our approval process is like and opportunities for ABRF input. You'll see that at every stage of the process that we have ABRF rep representation on committees, different task forces, strategic initiatives, which is such a great way to really show how involved ABRF is and how much we value ABRF's membership in FASIB. Then I'll transition to some ongoing activities and advocacy that we do on a yearly basis, things that come up that we respond to. I'll talk about science policy and leg legislative affairs, which is part of our public affairs department. And then I'll talk also about our efforts in DEAI and DataWorks, which is part of our strategic initiatives. I will also really highlight all of the work we've been doing for shared research resources, including a new task force that we had that launched in 2020 and closed just last last year. It's been it's been a while. <laughs> like time flies when you work in this space. Um, but I really wanted to elevate that and showcase everything that, that the task force did. Then I will close with just some current needs, how ABRF can continue to contribute opportunities for you to get involved in FASIB and talk about some future directions that FASIB is looking about, some topics that are on our radar that really do overlap with a lot of what ABRF members care about as well. So if you're not familiar with FASAB, we are a federation made up of 26 different member societies. You'll see I have ABRF front and center specifically for this presentation um, because you guys are a huge part of our membership and a lot of what we do. But you can see that we span a broad range of different biological and uh, biomedical disciplines, which is really nice because it, it enables me as a science policy person to really capture multiple perspectives as I'm thinking about writing or responding to a federal request for information to make sure that I'm really trying to capture all of biomedical research as a whole. Our overall mission is to advance health and well-being by promoting research and education in biological and biomedical sciences through collaborative advocacy and service to our societies and their members, which is you all. And we take a four-pronged approach to accomplish this mission. A lot of it is policy research and development. Advocacy is a huge component to this. We really do serve as that government liaison between scientific scientists on the ground as and on behalf of scientific societies and then the government agencies themselves. It's a lot of coalition building. We're a part of a lot of different coalitions, a lot of different professional societies to make sure that we are in the know, we, we are on the ground understanding the key issues that are pertinent to you all and how you do your work. And then of course, you wouldn't be able to do advocacy or any of this without communication and outreach. So we are always in contact with you all and, and figuring out ways that we can better serve you. So FASIB's governance structure, we of course, it's, it's a pretty typical structure. We have our board of directors, which really guide everything we do and they keep us on our toes to make sure that we always abide by FASIB's strategic missions, our strategic plan and make sure we are, we are on task and, and serving our members well. We also have a science policy committee and underneath that we have topical subcommittees that are part of the science policy committee. You'll see that the subcommittees report, it's an upward reporting structure. So the subcommittees report to the science policy committee which reports to the board of directors. And I wanted to highlight here that at every stage we have ABRF representatives which is a good member benefit um, as part of FASIB. 
So on our animals in research and education, we have ABRF representative, Dr. Rena Lapidus. On the science policy committee, we have here today, Dr. Andy Chitty. And our, on our board of directors, we of course have Dr. Nick Ambulo. So it's really at every stage, we have someone from ABRF representing and knowing what FACIB is up to. I also wanted to highlight that at one point we did have an entirely separate subcommittee on shared research resources, which leads me to the reason we spun that down is because it got elevated to a task force. So a task force is a board reported a board level task force that's more of a specialized committee that has more of a focused one year charge. We have different task forces over the course of various years. So we've had One Health, we've had Shared Research Resources led by the lovely Dr. Sheena Mache and Dr. Nick Ambulos. And then we had one that just finished recently focused specifically on early career researchers. These are just a few that I'm listing here. It, it would take many, many slides to show you everything that we're involved in, but I wanted to highlight how some Sometimes a key topic that's of great importance to FASIB does get elevated to something bigger. We also have our strategic initiatives and our board level committees. Now, these are things like diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion, our data works advisory committee, our leadership development committee, where Sheena, Sheena sits, and we also have our audit committee, where Mark sits, and you'll hear from later today. So anytime we have to, we issue a statement or we respond to a federal agency request for information, there is a very rigorous approval process, kind of like the peer review process that we have here at FASIB. So step one is it has to receive approval by our appropriate subcommittee. And of course, that is where ABRF representation and review is, is a part of that. Second, once that gets approved by the subcommittee, it has to get approval by the Science Policy Committee. And again, ABRF um, is represented at that committee and looks at these materials and can offer feedback. And step three, of course, it then goes to the Board of Directors, where again, we have our board representative who reviews this and, and can offer feedback at their monthly meetings. And I also wanted to highlight, we really do try to prioritize the perspectives of early career representatives. It's just so integral to our biomedical research workforce. We really wanted to highlight that. And I thought it important to specifically talk about it today. Now, FASIB defines an early career researcher and a representative as an individual within seven years of their first independent faculty position or research scientist role. And to really make sure that they're, they're perspectives are heard, we have three representatives on both the Board of Directors and the Science Policy Committee, and that's a two-year appointment. We also have several already on the Animals in Research and Education, as well as our, our Workforce Subcommittee, too. So we really, I wanted to highlight this, that this is an opportunity to get engaged early in, in your scientific career if you're interested in science policy mm -hmm. and advocacy. So now I'll transition out of the governance situation and more into what we do on a daily basis. How do we serve you as ABRF members? Everything I'm going to talk about here is available on our website. So if you go to FASIB.org, you'll see on the left-hand side this um, a nice toolbar where you can click in and to your heart's desire and find everything that, I, that I'm going to talk about. But I wanted to highlight a few things for you here today. I like to call this policy and advocacy in action. We do a lot, and I really wanted to highlight a few things, both in science policy and legislative affairs, which is more like strictly Capitol Hill. So from the science policy standpoint, so far in 2023, we've already responded to 10 requests for information. A lot of FASIB's recommendations do make it into final agency guidance. So that's such a great win because it really shows the power of the policy process and why it's so important to be engaged. We've had 22 meetings with different federal agency and National Academy officials. We've provided four lectures or keynote presentations at different meetings and conferences. Earlier this year, we hosted a Capitol Hill briefing on the importance of animal research and why we need investment from Capitol Hill. We issued one new report on combating animal rights extremism, and that is a very common problem, unfortunately, and we wanted to highlight that in a new report on, be, on how to be proactive against this. And we've developed three fact sheets on both animal research issues as well as workforce issues, like what is a postdoc? If you go to Capitol Hill, a lot of folks don't know what a postdoc is. So we have those different types of resources that everyone that's a part of FACIB can use. 
Um, Andy can talk a little bit more about this, but the SPC, the Science Policy Committee, has monthly meetings. And every year, one key perk to being on the Science Policy Committee is we host a, a symposium every year. And the topic choice is up to the Vice President of Science Policy. And we've had topics ranging from diversity, equity, inclusion, rigor and reproducibility, our upcoming one is going to be talking about how do we shore up support for IDEA and EPSCoR and more rural institutions. Um, so, so it runs the gamut of what we talk about, but it's a really great opportunity to look forward on what FASIP can do. From a legislative affairs standpoint, we have our Capitol Hill Day, and Andy can share more about this because he attended our most recent one. This year, we had 45 FACET volunteers, 75 meetings with House and Senate members. We updated 159 fact sheets, meaning you can look up your state and the district you live in and see the amount of federal funding that goes to, to NIH and, and NSF and what that means for your district. We submitted 216 appropriations requests. We've had we joined four sign-on letters as part of our partnerships with different coalitions. We get asked to be interviewed by Science and Nature all the time. Um, and oftentimes we get quoted, and we're always monitoring what's happening on the hills. So anytime you have a question on, have you heard about this? You can reach out to us, and and we like to to stay engaged with our member societies to help you. Moving on to our strategic initiatives, and again, these are just clips from everything that you can find on the FASIB website. We have our DEAI initiative, and two things I wanted to highlight here is FASIB launched its CARES Award. It, these awards are really to help alleviate the financial burdens associated with caregiving for FASIB members. We recognize that it can really, it can oftentimes preclude you from progressing in your career and, and we feel like that there needs to be supplementation to that. So in 2022, we awarded five awards um, and in, we are just about to give away our 2023 awards in the next couple of months, which is exciting. But we did want to, that's a great perk if you're a part of, if you're a full member society of FASIB. We also launched our LEAD program, which is a reverse mentoring program that pairs senior level professionals, that can be a PI, it could be a dean of a school, with junior level mentors to really help foster this meaningful dialogue within the workplace and help have a bi-directional relationship across. We had our first cohort, la cohort last year where we had four pairs and our next round of applications just opened in case you're interested. Moving on to DataWorks, which is which is of great, um, great. It's, it's very salient to everything that sh shared research resources and ABRF does. But this is really an initiative that brings together the biological and biomedical communities to advanced health um, through data sharing and reuse. There's a lot of questions with regarding data sharing, and as you all know, earlier in January, NIH's new data management and sharing policy went into effect, so there are a lot of components to that. But essentially, the DataWorks initiative has three components to it. There are data salons. This is just a conversation space in Zoom to share ideas, best practices, and, and get, that, get that conversation going. We have a help desk, which just launched earlier this year, that provides guidance to help navigate and, and help you adapt to this new data management policy because it can be hard to interpret and make sure that you're in compliance. And then we have the DataWorks Prize. And this is really just to, to recognize and acknowledge all of the different work and the different teams that are, are really trying to integrate data sharing and reuse in their work and their ongoing work. So we have a $500,000 prize purse, and that gets divided across 16 teams. Um, in case you tuned in earlier this year, we did have a whole symposium that really highlighted the different, the different teams and all of the awardees. So that was fantastic and things that we are continuing to do in the future. So that prize just opened in case you are interested. Now, I would be remiss if I did not really highlight all of the policy and advocacy we've done and continue to do for shared research resources. Here on the FASIB website, you see everything that we have dedicated to why cores are so important and why the work that you guys do are so important. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we had a whole task force dedicated to this because the board really identified shared research resources as an area of need. This was launched in June 2020, and we started off with biweekly meetings, and then it got so intense we started meeting weekly. Um, overall, without getting into all of the details, um, the task force identified five actions that the community can take to maximize investments in cores. Number one, improve institutional stewardship, expand access to shared research resources, grow a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive shared research resource workforce, 
increase and sustain federal investments. It's not just a one-time thing. This needs to be a consistent investment and prior prioritize sustainability. I think I saw Kathy on the call, so I know she's like, yes, that was all about me because she really led the charge on, on in those discussions. And it's great to see so many of the task force members on the call today. Now, as part of their work, which we did a lot of work in one year, it was astounding. We had one final report that's available on the FASEB website. It's also on ABRF's website. We also issued a policy brief that really asked um, ask federal agencies to establish a national strategy for shared research resources. And then to really kick off everything and, and highlight everything we've done, we had a round table. And you can find more information on that round table where we presented the report and shared ways that we can work together to, to make this a, a sustainable strategy moving forward. So current needs, how can you, you're probably sitting there, well, how can I be a part of this? What, what can ABRF do? So you all already do so much, but there are still opportunities for ABRF to engage. So I brought up this governance structure once again. Now, two areas where ABRF can continue to serve or areas where we have gaps and we, you can certainly ask us about it or ask the ABRF representatives on the different committees. So you can volunteer to serve on FACIB's different committees. We have a board, board representative, which is a four-year term, DEAI committee, which is a three-year term. I have in red listed areas where we have gaps and where ABRF could seek, um, seek a volunteer. SPC, where Andy can talk a little bit more, is a three-year term. Our publications committee is also a three-year term. We don't have an ABRF representative yet, and I don't believe we have. Subcommittees is also a three-year term. We have a training and career opportunities, and no one from ABRF is represented there quite yet. We do have someone on animals. And of course, early career representative. This is a two-year term on both the board and the SPC. We have not had an ABRF representative apply for this yet. So that's a great area for you guys to pursue. And then of course, if you are if you like being a part of these committees, don't be afraid to run for a leadership position. Run for vice president for science policy. You can chair the committee. You can decide the topic for the symposium that we have every fall. You can serve on the executive committee, which they meet weekly and they really learn all of the ins and outs of FACIP and what we do on a weekly basis. So that's really getting into the nitty gritty. And then you can also run to serve for vice president for DEAI committee. So I've highlighted again with this animation, just areas where there might be opportunity for ABRF to consider serving and engaging more with FACIP because we definitely appreciate your guys' expertise and value your input. And I will close with some policy topics that are on our radar for, for you all to think about and, and maybe overlap with a lot of ABRF's initiatives. Building research capacity. I mentioned this earlier because that is a topic of focus that the symposium will focus on later. Things like infrastructure and workforce support. How do we, how do we help IDEA and EPSCoR states? How do we level the playing field so that no matter where you are, no matter what zip code you're in, you have the same opportunities and resources in science? Data management and sharing, that is going to be the theme for, I believe, the next five to 10 years. This open access, uh, public access, those are all very key things that FACIP is monitoring and thinking about. DEAI is super important and drives everything that we do, as well as rigor and reproducibility from animal research to things on up to just, you know, scientific scientific management of data. How do we how do we have rigor and reproducibility at the forefront? And that's where ABRF and core facilities could really be of value here. And then um, because I am the animal research person as part of FACIB, support and access to animals and research is a big priority for us as well. We need to continue being proactive on the Hill. Um, non-human primates, there's a huge problem with the supply chain there. How do we protect researchers because they often get harassed from animal rights groups? And that's, I think core facilities could be a key role and resource here too. And then looking ahead and thinking about these emerging technologies and, and non-animal models. So I know that was a lot of information, but I know we have a lot of other perspectives to share. So this is my email. Please feel free to contact me, connect with me anytime. I'm always here to help and be of service to, to you as, as members of FACET. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that comprehensive uh, overview, Naomi. Um, I did have one question for you before we moved on. You talked a lot about early career positions. Um, and I sort of wondered if you could explain a little bit more about what you think early career would look like in a core in specific, you know, since we don't necessarily follow that. PhD, postdoc. Sure. 
Um, sure. That, I think many of us may be in that situation and maybe just not realize it. Yeah, that's true. I think I would make sure you're within the definition of FASIB's early career representative dis- definition. So that's within, if you just entered your staff management position in a core and you're within seven years of that position, you qualify as early career in FASIB's eyes. So early career in academia is different from how FASIB views it. So wherever you are in the core, if you're within seven years of that position, you work in a core as an administrator or as just a, as, as a technician, I think that would still be very valuable input because you're so early in your career and you can offer a lot of expertise that's beyond the typical tenure track situation. Wonderful, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our ABRF representatives on FASEB. Um, today we have speaking uh, Mark Lively who has a long and illustrious FASAB career that I will let him go into more detail about. Um, We're gonna follow that up with Andy Chitty, who is, as Naomi mentioned, on the FASAB Science Policy Committee. Um, And then Sheena Mache to talk a little bit about some future directions and some opportunities that we have to contribute as ABRF. Um, So with that, I'll turn it over to Mark and Andy and Sheena, um, and then we'll address some questions at the end. And in the meantime, any questions that you have, please feel free to put them in the chat as you're thinking of them. Thanks, Marie. And thank you, Naomi. That was a very nice summary of what, what FASAB has, has done for ABRF for so, so long. Um, you know, I got started with ABRF. Those of you who were at the meeting uh, in Boston recently saw the award to Ron Neese, who was one of the founding members of, of ABRF. I was at that very first meeting in San Diego when it, we were there as an organization to basically not even an organization at all, but but Ron and others proposed that we should start ABRF. I think that was somewhere in the mid eighties. I'm not really sure about that, but it wasn't too long after that, that, that the current uh, ABRF president, Linda Bonewald, cornered me in Bellevue, Washington and said, hey, Mark, you should, you should be on the ex- executive board. So I said, okay, what's that mean? Well, that started it. Uh, so in 1990, sorry, 2000, I became a member of the ABRF executive board and to my surprise, I was elected president in the next year. So suddenly I hear I was president of ABRF, this relatively new organization. Uh, we didn't have a Ken Shopman at the time. Uh, those of us, the volunteers, ran the whole show the entire time. Uh, so it took a lot of time. Laurie Steinke was my treasurer and, 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 and assistant in the whole process. But we, you know, we did a lot and, and pushed it, things along. And... Uh, at the end of my term there, uh, I became, uh, I was asked to, in, in 2002, uh, I soon after that was appointed to the Fort Board of Directives at FASIB, and that was in 20, uh, 2004. And you may have noticed that I, I've actually served all of the officer positions of FASIB since then. I was the uh, our first job was a membership committee. So I was one of the people that was, was getting other societies to join. And one of the things that everybody has in the past had difficulty understanding is that FASA is a, is a society where, where it's a federation of member societies, not of individuals. So when you try to talk about how many people, how many scientists are associated with FASA, it's really kind of a hard number to put your finger on. I saw in one of Naomi's slides, the number seems to be about 110,000 now because many of our scientists are members of more than one society. So they get sort of double counted if you add up all of them. But it's a very large number. And that's the, that's the key to the influence of FASIB on the Hill and at NIH. We represent enough of you guys, of scientists, who know what's going on. And as long as we provide the information to the appropriate people and in the appropriate channels, we get influence. Now, Society, uh, ABRF today has roughly 2,500 members, but when we were beginning to work with FASA, we really had fewer than 700 members. So we were one of the smaller societies, not like the American Physiological Society and nutrition and, and all of those. We had an outsized influence on FASA because we participated, and that helped us a lot. It led to these uh, shared research, research resource reports that came on in later, later years. So uh, you know, I, I would say if you if you have any interest at all in learning how the system of science works and participating and in, in influ- influencing it, ABRF, as a member of ABRF representing uh, interest within FASIB, 
or becoming part of FASIB yourself is a great way to do it. As part of that, when I became president of uh, FASIB, uh, it opened some doors for me. I had meetings from, I met almost all of the institute and center directors at NIH during that time. Uh, I certainly came to know the office of director, uh, offices of Francis Collins, and before that, uh, Azir Huni. Uh, and even in the White House, I didn't actually go in the White House itself, but we met with the Office of Science and Technology Policy, OS OSTP, uh, which is in the Eisenhower Building, which is next door. So that was a really um, uh, a nice event to, to get input to the direct science advisor to the president at the time. And that was Obama's uh, OSTP director. So, uh, but when you go to FASA, the other, the, the one thing that you should try to find a way to get involved with is what we call the Hill visits, because that's where you, and typically what the Hill visits try to do is identify uh, representatives from each of the constituent states, from the states, so that they can cover the bases, if you will, of, this, of, the, of the House members and Senate members who uh, have important roles in determining science policy and, and importantly, science funding. You learn an enormous amount by going through that process of how it all works and how to, to present your, your um, ideas and your, your expertise and the importance of what you do to people who can really make a difference. Uh, if it's policy at NIH, these requests for information that frequently come down from NIH with a very short timeline, uh, Naomi can attest to this, they'll come in and, and they'll want the answer in two weeks or three weeks or some number like that. And to really amass a, 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 a reasonable and an accurate response, you've got to get a lot of people moving all at once and input and to, to organize it. But those can have a tremendous input. Uh, 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 when NIH was re renovating, or I forget what they call it, enhancing peer review, uh, when I was uh, involved, uh, that was a big, long series of, of meetings and, 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 and uh, with the public and with the scientists about, you know, how are we going to make peer review better than it is? And that influenced a lot of things. It made a lot of difference to a lot of scientists about how their grants were submitted, how they were reviewed. So. All of those things are very critical for those of us who run core lab laboratories, because remember, the fuel that runs our lab comes through the NIH to funds that go directly to investigators who use our facilities. And that we always have to keep in mind that we have to be a team to show not just why the core facilities or shared resources should be supported, but why the scientists that use them should be supported and how that benefits the US benefits science policy and everything about it. Ultimately, I, uh, as a result of my involvement with ABRF and with, with FASIB, I was appointed to two national advisory committees at NIH. One was the National Center for Research Resources, which was one of the, was the, the main center at NIH that supported uh, particularly the Shared Instrument Grant Program, uh, and, and, a lot, and animal facilities and animal, uh, all the animals uh, resources that are available. Uh, during that time, uh, Francis Collins decided it wasn't important anymore and had it dissolved, basically, and distributed the, the components to various different ICs. Uh, but at, toward the end of that, in spite of my opposition to what Francis was trying to do, I got appointed to what they call the Council of Councils, which is sort of a, a, a strange name of, of uh, and it's actually the National Advisory Council that's directly, it directly advises the NIH director. So, you know, your voice can be heard and ABRF is a great place to start. And if you can find a way to, to uh, uh, fill some of the, the, the holes that FASIB currently has for, for representatives from ABRF, take a chance, go look at it, go what you're gonna do. Uh, the Science Policy Committee is a great place to understand what's going on and be a participant. And, and you'll find that, that FASIB will advance your career because your visibility at the at the higher levels of, of, of funding agencies and and of the government uh, will increase and it'll open opportunities for you in other places. So you know I I'm available anytime uh, you can get my email from from the ABRF folks and I'll be happy to talk to you or, or, or email with you whatever you want to do. Uh, and let you know uh, more about how how it's important. So, uh, somebody's asking, is FASIB a nonprofit? Yes, of course, it it definitely is. Um, it's a not not for profit organization. So uh, that was just posted on chat. So, 
anyway, I'll stop there and turn it over to Andy because Andy's still in the in the midst of it, and I'm I, my last responsibilities for FAST have ended. Gosh, almost ten years ago. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, certainly a uh, massive amount of work that you've done and, of course, very uh, much appreciated. Um, I'm going to start my screen. Hopefully, if someone can give me a thumbs up that you can see that okay. That's great. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, uh, my name's Andy Chitty, and um, I, I work for OHSU. Um, this is, um, I, I'm here to talk about uh, my work as the representative to the FACIP Science uh, Policy Committee. Um, I have to say, I'm really honored to uh, have been asked to represent um, ABRF in this group. Um, I, as past president of ABRF, I rolled off the executive board and uh, uh, this, uh, to me, was a, was a wonderful way to pro uh, to progress uh, in in being able to be involved and engaged. So, um, I really appreciate the opportunity to represent all of you. Um, uh, the Science Policy Committee monitors and advises FACEP's president and board of directors on public policy topics, federal initiatives, and issues of importance to us and other FACEP member societies. Um, I know Naomi went through a, a lot of uh, things and, and Mark touched on a few of the things uh, that uh, I have in the slide. So some of these I'll go through re relatively quickly uh, and skip over a couple. Uh, but um, some of the activities uh, we meet once a month, as Naomi said, to talk about uh, position statements um, and to provide uh, RFIs, um, uh, oversee and provide guidance on the efforts of the topical subcommittees. Um, provide input on projects and activities, um, and coordinate consensus efforts. Uh, a lot of this uh, stuff was taken from the FASEB website, so I encourage you to go to that and, and look up the SPC, the Science Policy Committee, uh, going forward. Um, then... Uh, um, the other one of the other activities uh, or the the other two activities that we do uh, in person are the annual in person symposiums uh, this year, of course, is going to be on research capacity. Um, last year, among some of the other discussions around DEI uh, was um, master's level uh, education and in STEM and how to to um, uh, continue to uh, develop um, uh, careers for people at master's level uh, uh, in STEM, and also the Capitol Hill Day, which I'll talk a little bit more uh, about later. Um, of course, full FASA member societies have uh, opportunities to act, uh, to participate in subgroups. Right now, Animals in Research and Education, uh, training and career opportunities. The DEAI uh, group, I believe Tanya Mesa is is working with the DEAI uh, at FASA, but I'm, I'm I'm not sure. It looked like uh, we had an open spot on that, but um, we can check into that later. Um, uh, again, the CARES Awards, I, I think, is just a really fantastic uh, uh, um, opportunity, and I think that's a, a, a was was just a brilliant idea uh, for assisting some of our colleagues who who need that kind of help. And of course, there's the Science Policy Committee and uh, Capitol Hill Day. Um, Capitol Hill Day is, of course, one of the premier FASEB advocacy events. Uh, I was uh, I uh, participated in Capitol Hill Day two years ago for the first time, but it was online, an online virtual. And so this was the first time that I was able to uh, participate in person. Um, so it gives us an opportunity to serve as representatives for FASEB in communications with Congress and promote uh, scientific research by interacting directly with the policy members and their staff. And of course, uh, it broadens FASEB's visibility and influence on Congress and uh, in connection with that, our, our own, um, which I think is, is so critical uh, to, to us, particularly in the sciences in this day and age. So just to um, uh, show you a few of the pictures that I, I had from the day, um, it was very, very early start to the morning uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, we uh, uh, headed over to the FASEB headquarters for uh, breakfast uh, before it even got light outside. And for me coming from the West Coast, that was even three hours earlier. Uh, so it was, uh, it was quite an early morning. And then we headed over on bus to the Capitol Hill 
And um, uh, uh, here, the, the middle picture is entering the, the government offices. And then um, on the right-hand side, um, I, I was accompanied and paired up with Charlie Roberts of the Oregon National uh, uh, Primate Research Center, which is out here in the Portland area as well. And he and I were representing Oregon, along with the gentleman uh, in that picture who was served as our guide and introduced us to the representatives we were meeting with uh, and uh, helped us hone our message going into the day. So there's a fair amount of preparation uh, associated with this to make sure we're ready to uh, talk as eloquently as possible and articulate the, the kinds of things that we want to, to accomplish and to focus on. As a bit of an aside, I know everybody talks a lot about uh, government waste. Um, I wanted to let everyone know I was trying to help identify and uh, find government waste. I did find it. It was right here in the cafeteria area, right next to the granola bars and the uh, and the coffee um, makers. And um, unfortunately, there didn't seem to be a lot of interest in uh, addressing the government waste, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep trying as we go, as we do more of these. Uh, so that's uh, that's my little, I guess, uh, aside dad joke. I'm only allowed one bad dad joke per presentation, according to Ken. So I'll, I'll move on from there. Um, we did uh, these. These were the people that Charlie and I met with: uh, Senator uh, Jeff Merkley, uh, Senator Ron Wyden, and a newly elected representative Lori Chavez de Raymer, um, uh, from uh, Clackamas County, um, and Representative Susan Bonamici. Um, and then this was the sign outside of uh, Ron Wyden's office. So it was quite exciting to uh, be able to uh, uh, meet with these folks. Actually, we met with their staff. I was able to shake uh, hands with uh, Jeff Merkley. Um, uh, Ron Wyden was planning to come but uh, uh, in person, but wasn't able to make it. But one of the things that I will note is that the staff was amazing. Um, they're very oftentimes very young people around my own kids' age, but brilliant and uh, and very active. And so it was it was quite a um, uh, quite an encouraging process to interact with people who are who are so forward thinking and so so interested in in um, their uh, uh, making a difference in in in. Um, science and science policy and uh, government structures. So th that was really a, a, a nice part of that. Um, uh, our asks, uh, we were um, asking for from the National Institute of Health at least 50, uh, just under $51 billion for funding for the coming year for, uh, for, for NIH. And then the NSF, um, we were asking for at least $15.7 billion. Um, we had talking points for other uh, other asks for other funding opportunities, but those were the kind of the top two, um, the top two uh, uh, budget asks that we were uh, tasked with. Um, and again, this this goes back to kind of what Mark was talking about. Uh, we're talking about not just when we're talking as a society and looking at our own society and our own cores, we're also talking about the whole uh, ecosystem of science uh, overall. And these asks are really important to be able to fund those researchers that then uh, um, uh, work with us in the cores. Um, so I was able to talk specifically a little uh, about cores of both the previous two years and, and uh, the things of interest to ABRF. I, I was able to talk about cores as critical infrastructure um, for our uh, uh, for our research uh, ecosystem. And then uh, uh, Charlie, of course, was able as as the primate research center um, representative he was uh, able to talk very very much in depth about the importance of animal models um, so in particular i wanted to mention just some of the things that we talked about with oregon it, there were a couple of different approaches to capitol hill day that i uh, was um uh, that that we sort of um adjusted based on who we were going to be talking to and what their particular interest right might be. There are those who are very much interested in science and, and the uh, medical research institute that we come from, or Oregon Health and Science University, but there are others who are perhaps more concerned about the economic impacts and number of jobs, and OHSU is one of the top three uh, employers in Oregon, so Aside from the scientific information that we gave, we talked about the fact that 
uh, Oregon uh, um, it has an economic impact of about uh, $7.2 billion on the state, which has tripled since almost 2007. Uh, it impacts about 42,600 jobs in our state. And uh, the average annual wage as of 2019 was uh, around uh, a little over $75,000. So without OHSU, the annual economic uh, output in Oregon would, would fall by about $3.8 billion. So it just kind of shows that not only, you know, that the, the science is very important, but the impact that we have on our economy is, is also really critical and can um, uh, spark the interest of our representatives as well. So uh, it, it was just a, a really a fantastic opportunity. The first time I met it with uh, people in person on Capitol Hill and uh, really appreciated, again, the opportunity to, to represent ABRF and I, I hope to be able to do so well uh, in the future. Uh, again, um, this is what the Science Policy Committee does and I encourage you to reach out to uh, Mark or Ken or Naomi uh, to find out what you can do to be more involved. Uh, I'm of course happy to talk as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Andy. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to speak for a long time. I think um, what was covered previously and what Mark talked about, um, really mirrors a lot of my experience with BASIB. I will say it was an outstanding opportunity. Uh, I learned so much um, from the publications committee to you know, being on the board, to be on science policy, uh, you know, heading a subcommittee, being on a task force, uh, working with colleagues. It is, um, the only thing I can, really say is that it really expands your horizons. And it really, our role as ABRF members is incredibly important in a number of areas that Naomi highlighted and that Andy talked about, because we are, you know, this very large part of the ecosystem of science and biomedical research. And, you know, there, there were two areas, you know, because they asked me, well, you know, talk about the future, you know, what what would be a, a way that ABRF members could engage <clears throat> in FACID. And clearly, you know, DEAI is a very important area. Animal research, you know, we all support animal research, whether you're doing animal research or not, we're all working on developing disease models, characterizing those preclinical models. Um, but two areas I wanted to focus on is the FASIB training and career development because I think we bring a different perspective. And I think that, you know, the other thing we need to remember is that we actually train the future generation um, in cores because everything is about technology and developing skills and expertise. And so personally, I think our PhD training model is broken. And I think that there are opportunities in careers, in shared resources for, for PhD scientists. And one area that I think we should be advocating for is postdoctoral funding for PhD scientists who want to go into shared resources. I mean, you know, that we've talked about this. I think this is really an important area. Um, and then the second, of course, is data works. Uh, we, data is our deliverable, right? DataWorks is a fabulous, facet. Um, how do they characterize themselves? It's, they're a convener. Um, they are a culture change initiative and they act as a convener. This is exactly what DataWorks has been successful with. And we have worked um, very closely with DataWorks. We advocate, you know, many of the same things that DataWorks um, advocates for. So we are, we are very close partners. We had Emily Ruff come to be part of the ABRF 2023 CCOR presentation in terms of uh, shared resource stakeholders in promoting um, sharing scientific data, because that's what we do. We share scientific data. 
So I would encourage all of you to reach out there, start attending the data work salons, go to the help desk, really get in there. And, you know, because we have, we are a very important stakeholder in data management and sharing. We have to advocate for our IDs. We have to advocate for the permanent, unique identifiers for the data. We have to advocate for, you know, permanent data repositories. And who better than the people who are creating, you know, the data? So I'll leave it with that. There are so many opportunities, but those are two that I wanted to highlight that I think uh, FACET members, uh, ABRF members could really contribute as FACET members. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sheena and Mark and Andy. Um, now we're going to uh, start the question and answer portion of this particular town hall. And I wanted to um, call special attention to one of the first questions that we got, which is the difference between lobbying and advocacy. This is a question that I know I get a lot and I oftentimes don't get a great, have a great way to explain it. Um, and both Naomi and Mark put some very comprehensive answers in the chat, but I was hoping one of them would be kind of willing to summarize that here. Naomi, you're the pro. No, technically your answer was great too. I think, and we were thinking similarly, it is tricky. There is a very blurry line between the two. Advocacy, you are you are not allowed to make financial contributions, number one, and you are not lobbying on behalf of an entity. So, so for example, Andy could not go to Capitol Hill Day and lobby on behalf of Oregon Health and Sciences University. He was just raising his perspective as an individual member and scientist. Um, and if, if, and that's what advocacy is all about. Lobbyists have to formally register and they often make donations to federal officials um, for, for to get their ask. Advocacy, you are taking a nonpartisan approach and you are speaking on behalf of a of a member society or of of as just an individual of your your key areas that, that are important to you. Um, and I would also say advocacy can take more of an indirect route. It's not just giving money or going to Capitol Hill. Like I was talking about, we have a very rigorous science policy process. If NIH issues a request for information that really enables us as a, as a big federation to develop comments and in, include ABRF's perspectives and views and deliver those comments on behalf of our organization to NIH. And that's a really critically important way and often underutilized tool because these comments are taken seriously by NIH as they work to inform or update their policy guidances or change their policy and whatnot. So it really ultimately affects the work that you do. So advocacy is a lot more involved. It's a lot more indirect. It's not partisan and it's not dealing with money. I, I would add, if you do participate, one thing that we didn't emphasize quite enough is um, you must not go and represent the position of your institution as such. When you meet with your congressperson, you don't say, oh, I'm with Oregon and uh, this is what we need. That's not why you're there. You're there to say the, purpose, the support of science is important and the $51 billion that, that you're going to, going to pass in the next appropriations is important for supporting the whole system. And if you if you go, particularly you'll step on toes of your of your institutional administrators, because you have to be very careful not to cross something that they think is a major issue that you may disagree with. And you don't want to bring that up. You don't want to cross that bridge. You want to just say, I'm here as a scientist in a shared resource facility. I know how science works. And I can help you to understand how that is and better guide your decisions with regard to policy that would be at NIH or with funding at, at, in Congress. So, so that really is, in fact, I would argue that if you don't know your institutional advocacy advocate office, you should go there and talk to them and, and at least find out because sometimes they may actually be interested in have, having you support their, their approaches, but, but at least be sure that they don't get word back from that congressperson that met with you that you said something that was perhaps not aligned with what your institution wants to have. Yeah, in fact, I, I, I would I would state that, I, first of all, I did go to my own uh, uh, policy advocacy group at or OHSU to get talking points, particularly around uh, Oregon and uh, economic impact uh, numbers that I talked about. 
Um, but you're you're absolutely right. It's not your job to um, to represent your institution, and you can very easily uh, misstep and misspeak in that process. So uh, that's why FASEB is so great in preparing us for the advocacy approach, because um, we uh, kind of go through training on how to avoid um, getting into arguments or uh, on policy or political arguments, but rather to stick to the message of why is science important and why should it be funded as a whole? I'd like to add one. We, we haven't mentioned anything about the Howard Garrison uh, Advocacy Fellowship that's just begun. This is a way, if you're really serious about this and there's something that you think you might want to do, it's a 10-month experience that's partially funded. Uh, it's a course. It's people who know how to do this, Naomi and others, and, and Jennifer Seitzer uh, are, are, are the people who run it. And it's, uh, we raised a bunch of money. I was part of the committee that I am still part of the development committee for FASIB. And uh, so you can just go to FASIB.org and it'll be the first, uh, one of the first scenes that, that pops up and you can read about it. But if this is something you're really interested in, uh, give, this a, give this a look and find out if you're, if you're um, eligible to apply. And for those of us with day jobs, it's a thing you can do concurrently with? Um, I'm not sure about that. You would have to take a 10. I think, I think it's on site. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Naomi? No, it's not completely on site. You would take the course and you are able to do it, most of it virtually. And then at one point we could invite you to come in person for certain activities. But the goal is, you know, you can do your day job, but while learning about science policy and advocacy. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we have just about two minutes left. Um, so, um, Marie, let me make a couple of quick comments from my perspective on the board of directors. And, and that is ABRF plays really a critical role in, in FASA because we're kind of in some ways the square peg in the round hole. All the other societies of FASA are really science driven. So you've got, for example, the American Association of Immunologists, ASBMB, Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. These are all our, the customers that we provide services to. So it helps ABRF get our points across and emphasize what we do to these societies and it gets back to their members. So I, I just wanted to, to point that out because it, you know what we do really impacts all of FASA uh, and, and all the societies and their members. Perfect. Thank you, Nick. I knew you couldn't make it without having something to say. <laughs> um, now, now a quick question. Uh, the fellowship, I saw the direction for the fellowship, uh, and I was really interested about it. Uh, but our question is, it requires you to be in Capitol Hill for the Advocacy Day, and I think a couple of days for workshops somewhere. So it's like two or three days throughout the year. Uh, but that's in usually in fall, and some of us might be teaching, so we may not be able to go. So is it a hardcore requirement that you have to make the commitment to be there, or what happens if you just can't go? You know, that's a good question. I can put you in touch with um, the two organizers that are leading this. I don't think it's a hard and fast rule that you absolutely have to. We're trying to work out maybe hybrid participation as well, so that there are some, some so to as a way to increase accessibility for folks that have multiple commitments. So I wouldn't entirely rule it. Like, don't not apply for it because that's precluding you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we are at the top of the hour and I'd like to thank everyone so much for your participation, um, as well as uh, Naomi and Mark and uh, Sheena and Andy. Uh, and of course, Nick uh, for being here with us today. Thank you, everybody, and have a great afternoon.